What's going on, 1030? How we doing? How we doing? We doing good? So good to be here. It's a good day. I, I, I think by faith the smoke is going to go away and it's going to be a good day. Um, hey, uh, my name is Brian. If we haven't met, I'd love to meet you. I'm one of the pastors here on staff and I'm excited about a couple things that are coming up next week. We are starting a three-week teaching series called Harbor and Base. We believe this at Anchor, that we want this to be a harbor. You know, a harbor is a place of safety from a challenging environment. And here's what it would look like for you to find this as a harbor. You might find people that you know, as John mentioned, with anchor groups, but you might just even experience coming in and like your shoulders loosening up rather than tightening up. We've all been in environments when we, we tighten up like that. Or you might inv- find yourself like your breathing coming a little easier rather than like those short, quick spurts that show that you're anxious. A harbor is a place where you can really realize that you're safe. And a world that's challenging, we need harbors. And so at Anchor, we want to be a harbor, but we don't want to just be a harbor because if we're just a harbor, then we feel really cozy and comfortable and we stay in kind of this Christian cul-de-sac. We are also called to go out into the world, so this is not just a harbor, it's a base. Whereas a harbor is a place of safety from a challenging environment, a base is a place of preparation for a challenging environment. And so this is what we want to be at Anchor. And so over the next three weeks, starting, starting next Sunday, we're going to be talking about this culture, harbor-based culture here at Anchor. Invite your friends. Make sure to not miss it. It's going to be a great time for you to re-understand or understand for the first time what we care about here at Anchor. And then on the 25th, get a load of this, it is our four-year anniversary as a church. So, um, which is huge. Some of you might not even have known that we've been around just for really a short time. And so just like come. Our Lincoln campus and, and, and us here at Central, we're going to be coming together. There's going to be food. There's going to be fun. It's going to be a party. Don't miss it, et cetera. Yes. All right. Hey, but right now we're ending this, uh, this teaching series called Fourfold, and so we've talked about all these windows into the way of Jesus. Jesus says Savior. He saves us, saves us. He rescues us. Jesus says Sanctifier, which means he brings us into, he helps us look more like him as we walk with him, and as we're filled with the Spirit and empowered by the Spirit, we start to look more like Jesus. That's what Jesus, our Sanctifier, means. And then last week we talked about Jesus as our healer. He wants to heal, and healing shows up in a variety of ways, but he wants to to heal, and today we're talking about Jesus as our coming king. Very light uh, topic, um, so should be good. Hey, I have this belief, okay? I have this conviction, I would say, that every one of us has this God-given desire for things to be made right. Would you agree? We have this God-given desire for things to be made right. When we read the News Tribune and we hear of another crime that that is like, oh, this should not happen, that is a God-given desire. Here's the thing, that every one of us has. You might not even be a person who believes in God, but God has placed that desire for things to be made right within you. So it, sometimes it manifests differently. Like people that would identify as progressives, they would think that like the way things to be made right, it, it, it happens where we loosen the shackles of the past so that we can step into something approximating utopia or something better in the future. And conservatives would, would say, actually the way things are made right is by, by realigning with past principles and values that we've left so that we can kind of like become better because we're suffering now because we've left them. And so there's different ways of thinking thinking about how things are made right, but every one of us has a desire for things to be made right. When we look at high crime rates, when we look at pollution, when we look at things like climate change or, or, or families in trial and challenge, we don't look at that and say, well, good for them, great, who cares? And in fact, if that happens, that's a mark of cynicism and callousness to pain that people are experiencing. That means that we we actually shouldn't get comfortable with that. That's something to kind of like, we need to ask God, soften my hearts when we feel that callousness. Every one of us has this desire for things to be made right. There's an ancient philosopher who said, you can understand that a stick is crooked Stay with me. Uh, You can understand that a stick is crooked because we have an innate understanding of what straight is, right? And similarly, we can understand that our world is bent and crooked because we have an innate understanding 
of what straight is, of what pure is, of what healed is. And God has given us this desire. So I, this is, again, my conviction. What, what if every one of us in the world, atheists and Christians, agnostics, every ethnicity, we all had an awareness that we are no longer in Eden and we wanted in the depths of our, in our heart for God to somehow make this world like Eden again. This is what the coming of Jesus is all about. So I'm going to read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, verses 13, all the way to chapter 5, verse 3. I want to invite you, if you have your a Bible accessible, open it up, take a look at this. This is like a, a passage of scripture that is often kind of like speculated upon, and maybe you've heard some different kind of ideas on it and stuff. So we, like, I just want all of us to be aligned if we can. So it's going to be on the screen. I'm going to be reading it, but open it up if you have access to that. So Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him according to the Lord's word. We tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, we who are still alive are left to be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying, peace and safety. Destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman. And they will not escape. What a place to end it there, Pastor. Okay, we're going to be looking at three different elements of the return of Jesus. And um, last week I mentioned that I wanted to be incredibly clear because um, healing is a kind of like an uh, interesting topic. And I was, we were hoping to be incredibly clear. Similarly today, uh, when we're talking about Jesus' return, well, we, I want to be incredibly clear. So I'm going to just say the points up front just so we can have them in our brain. Uh, the first one is the hope of his coming. The second is uh, the reality of his coming. And the third is the mystery of his coming. This is where we're going, the hope of his coming, the reality of his coming, and then the mystery of his coming. And, and first we're looking at the hope of his coming. Um, I remember when I was a new follower of Jesus, I, I came to faith like the end of my high school experience. And um, I had done like lots of the partying thing. I had done, uh, you know, I tried to answer these things, these, these really core needs through relationships and dating relationships and friendships and all that kind of stuff. And, and it seemed like every one of them, I had high expectations, but they all eventually fell flat. They didn't answer that need that I had. Um, and when I met Jesus, it was like, wow, that need is answered. There was this, this transformation, like this, it was like, as Pascal, the mathematician, says, we all have this God-shaped hole, and I, I felt the feeling of being satisfied and experiencing the rest that Jesus invites us to experience in relationship with him, and it changed everything about my life. I went into college, and like, I... I I would be comfortable going to church by myself because I just wanted to be around people that were talking about Jesus. I, I developed friendships and I, because with people that were followers of Jesus, even if they didn't like the same things as me, it didn't really matter because I had found Jesus and I wanted to learn more about Jesus and I wanted to be around people that loved Jesus and that was like, I just wanted more of Jesus. And then a couple months into kind of like my journey in growing and walking with Jesus, um, I started meeting certain types of people in the church that like kind of was, it threw me off a little bit. Um, uh, it was a little jarring. You know, I don't know if you've ever been hired and you're like, oh, I'm really excited about this job. Somebody's like, hey, how do you feel about your new job? You're like, oh, I'm really excited about this job. It's going to be perfect. I think I'm perfectly made for it. It's great. And then you walk in the first day and you're like, this is, there's like two people here that I like, you know. Um, 
And like, I, fortunately, I was, you know, there's a lot of people in the church that I really love, but there's occasionally some people that were like really fixated on like the return of Jesus and they had all the stats and the data and they had websites they could point me to about when it was going to happen and when the last blood moon was happening and, and when the news feed indicated that the return of Jesus was going to happen on this date. And if it didn't happen on that date, then there was just another date that they could look to down the field a little bit. And I, I, I found myself kind of like not that interested in hanging out with them on Friday night. You know, that was like not what I wanted to do. Um, and it was the kind of this thing where I was like, uh, um, I'm in on Jesus. I'm not always totally sure about his people, um, but I'm definitely in on Jesus. And um, one of the things that was interesting is that these folks um, in the church that God loves were often like angry and anxious. And I'm just looking at this passage that Paul's writing to the Thessalonians, this young church that he had a relationship with, that he was wanting to help them learn the way of Jesus. And when Jesus is talking about, or sorry, when Paul is talking about the return of Jesus here, he, the first thing he wants us to communicate is that this should be something that brings hope into your life. Not deepens anxiety and anger, not embitters you towards other people, not puts the walls up and the, the, the shields up around kind of this holy huddle and, and points to them as bad out there and silently waiting kind of like for the... Re- That's not the type of thing that Paul is saying when he's talking about the return of Jesus. He is suggesting, he's imploring, he is emphatically describing the return of Jesus as a thing of incredible hope. Here's, here's where he goes. You know, it's like, in the Thessalonian church, it looks like certain people were dying and they were grieving and they were upset. And so Paul's writing to them and, and he says, we don't want you to grieve like the rest of humanity who doesn't have hope. Grieve, yes. But don't let your grief be absent of hope. And he pins this, he anchors this on t- in two different ways. The first is, he says that Jesus died. And then Jesus rose. And because we're followers of Jesus, we know that death is not the last word. And so, so we don't have to think that, that, oh, they are gone and that is it. We can believe that there is a reunion waiting for us in eternity and it is on the horizon, which is good news. Paul's wanting them to know that. In fact, he uses this word, those who have gone asleep. It's kind of interesting language. It's not something that maybe we would be familiar with, but Paul is wanting us to see. It's like, it's like sleep. He's telling the Thessalonians, it's like sleep. They've, they've gone to rest and they will come and rise again. It's like a seed, you know, planted that late spring, there's a shoot up out of the ground. You've maybe even forgot about it, but it's all of a sudden there. This is what death is. Gone buried in the ground, but will rise again. So we should not grieve without hope. Grieve, yes. Grief is natural. We need to grieve, but we should do it also with hope. But then also he connects it not just with the death and resurrection of Jesus, but with the return of Jesus. He connects the cause and the the source of hope, not just with the death and resurrection, but with the return. He uses this language, he goes, until the coming of the Lord. And that word coming in the Greek is a, is a word parousia. And if you ever get into a theological conversation about the return of Jesus with somebody, just drop the word parousia and then just kind of drop the mic and just walk away. You know, that's all you need. You're good. Because it's the Greek word that's described of the return of Jesus. And here's the interesting thing with this Greek word parousia. Um, this word is actually a word that was commonly used um, in the ancient world to describe the appearance or the coming of a dignitary or king. In fact, it was used in this way. A king comes back to a city after having defeated um, uh, an opposing army. A king coming back victorious to his city and everybody is excited and jubilant and welcoming the king back into his own home. His, the victorious king has returned and we're going to throw a party. We're going to celebrate. We're not going to be silent because that would be terrible. We're excited that he's in the house. This is rad. That's all indicated with that word parousia. The, one, like the connection I've been thinking about as I've been preparing is that um, you know, sometimes when, um, 
when Candace goes on a couple nights away, uh, um, you know, with friends or something like that, she returns, she pulls her back in the driveway. We're all excited. We, we, sometimes we leave, we, we get out of the house, we, we go meet her. And, and I was talking to a friend during between the gatherings and, and Can, they asked, the friend asked Candace, she was like, they're like, how often does this happen? They're like, well, she's like, I wish it would happen a little bit more often. And, 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 but, but it's kind of this idea of like, we're so excited about the return. We're not going to stay inside on our video games or looking at our phone. We're dropping that. We're going out there because it's rad that the one we love has come home. And so when Paul is talking about, he's using this language to help us understand the excitement and the radness of the return of Jesus. And he's wanting the Thessalonians to see it as something that would bring hope into their life and excitement into their life. It's like the king that goes away on war and comes back victorious and he's celebrated upon his return. And so when it says we will go meet him in the air, oftentimes we hear kind of like very detailed out stories about like raptures being sucked us away and going so we can flee from this terrible existence. But when you look closer at the actual text, what's being communicated is when we go and meet him in the air, as Paul says, he's saying that is a picture of like, actually, we're so excited. We're going out past the city gates to welcome the king, not so we can flee this world because it's God forsaken, but that we can go back with it, with Jesus, so that he can make all things new because this world is actually God loved. This is what Paul is talking about. That it is not an evacuation plan, but it is actually the restoration plan. And this, this is what Paul's talking about. It's a source of hope. Revelation 21 um, talks about this. And we did, earlier in the summer, we did this six-week teaching series on Revelation. One of the most complex books, well, the most complex book in the New Testament, in the Bible, you could say, yeah, we did it in six weeks. So, um, I don't know. You know, we, we, we did skip over some things, admittedly. But um, in Revelation 21, it talks about how when, when this, this recreated, restored world where there's no homicide, there's no overdose, there's no environmental devastation, there's no injustice, it's healed. And it, it, it says that Jesus, he will wipe away every tear from your eyes. There, death will be no more. Like Jesus <clears throat> is committed to restoring his creation. This is the hope of his coming. That's why in verse 18, <clears throat> Paul says, therefore encourage one another with these words. He doesn't say, you know, like, like he's, he's, he's not saying like, therefore be frightened and terrified and anxious about when and if and try to find a date. No, he says, just encourage, encourage one another. Yeah, you're experiencing these trials in your community, Thessalonian church, but, but be reminded the death and resurrection of Jesus and the coming of Jesus means that we see the world differently from the rest of the world and we see the world with hope even when there's challenges, even when there's heartache, even when there's confusion, we can have this buoyant hope that's indestructible because it's rooted in the death-defying, returning Jesus. But it, um, it, it, it's actually, it's not just the hope of his coming. There's also this reality of his coming. The, the, the real, real, real reality. That's redundant. <laughs> Candace and I, um, when we were, my wife and I, when we were first married, we had this idea that we should uproot everything and move across the country. So we moved from Ellensburg, Washington to Massachusetts. Um, it's a whole nother story if that was like a good idea or not. Um, so that's like another story, maybe when we talk about like a marriage series or something. But, um, um, but we, we packed up this 15 foot um, budget truck um, with a, a, a tr car trailer and our 1986 Honda Accord um, on the back of it um, with, a, with a sunroof. You know, so pretty deluxe. And, um, and we're, we're driving, you know, across the country and like we want to hit the stops along the way. And so we go through Yellowstone and as at the end of getting through Yellowstone, we like are looking at the map. This is like, do you guys remember before iPhones? Um, like before Google Maps and like there is, there's this stuff. I don't know if you guys have heard, it's like called paper. And, um, and so we had um, Atlas. Do you, like this is, it's vintage. Um, 
an atlas and some printed out like, you know, Yahoo maps, you know, things. And we were like looking at it and we're like, we could go uh, like, like this way through a county highway um, and it seems like a very straight shot. Or we could go a hundred miles back and then connect with I-90 and that, would, that, that seems like a, not a straight shot at all. These were the two routes that were available. And I remember thinking like, it is a no-brainer, straight shot, county highway. We're going we're gonna to do a little off-road sightseeing. It's going to be great. And I remember we pulled over to the side of the road to kind of get our bearings and get straight. And there's this guy selling hot dogs across uh, right outside of Yellowstone. And I just was like, I'll ask the local. And um, I said, which way would you go? And he goes, you do not want to go on this county highway. And then, and I, I was like, are you serious? Do you, do you look at, this is a straight shot. This is like, it's not a straight shot. And he goes, trust me, you don't want to go. And I had this moment as I was returning back to this 15 foot budget truck with the car trailer. I, I was like, that guy sells hot dogs for a living. You know, <laughs> I'm like pretty sure I'm competent at map reading. That guy, I don't know. You know, I mean, to Debatable. I mean, revealing a little bit of judgmentalism. I get, okay, all right, I repent. But like, I, um, I'm unsure. And so I was like, came back to Kenneth, was sure. I'm like, hey, we're going this way and we're, it's going to be great. And we're going to cut some time off. We're going to get to our destination way quicker. Best decision I've made in the last couple of days. So she's like, all right, cool. And, uh, and so we were driving. And like within a half an hour of driving this direction, there's like this very impressive mountain range just right in front of us. And I was like thinking, I, surely there's a way around that. And Ke Candace and I were talking about it. We got closer. We were like, I don't see the way around that. And then, then it got to the point where there was like a 10% grade and these very aggressive switchbacks. And I was, we were going three miles an hour <laughs> up this hill and I sweat a lot. I sweat a lot. I, I do sports. I sweat. A lot. I mean, I'm always, the, I'm always the wettest. It's disgusting. And I don't think I've sweat much more than that period when my foot was buried in the floorboards and I was just trying to go fast, but it was literally three miles. And I was waiting for the car to stall out. And, and I say that because there was, there, like, oftentimes when we think about the return of Jesus, there's like two errors, Right? There's the overly fixated and angry and anxious and accusatory about some and the feeling really proud about yourself. That's the, that's the we need to reestablish the fact this is the hope of his coming to restore all things. And then there's kind of the other side where we dismiss it as a reality altogether. And we pretend it doesn't exist. And we think this has no bearing on me. I'm not going to pay attention. It's not, it's not something I have to worry about. It's not something that is even to be considered. And some of us, are, as followers of Jesus, we, we, we just write it off. We consider it as maybe a metaphor or whatever. And, and those that aren't followers of Jesus, we just don't even have any room for it in our brain. But Paul is saying that it is real. Paul is saying that it is coming for us, that it's there, that there's no way around it, that there's only approaching this thing called the return of Jesus. He tells the Thessalonians in chapter 5, verse 3, he says, while people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. This idea of labor pains is like an important picture because like Paul's wanting us to get this glimpse of something that's painful and beautiful and very, very real. He uses visceral like language to communicate the reality of this thing. That it is not a metaphor. It's not a hologram. It's not a myth. It is very real that it is going to happen. The return of Jesus is very real. Paul, elsewhere to the Philippians in this like poem in Philippians chapter 2, he, he says it like this. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on, under, on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And, and I think it's honest to assume that some of the knees that bow bow buckle under the shaking, wide-eyed realization that the thing that they had dismissed is actually real. 
And some of the tongues that confess the reality of Jesus do it stammering because they were not prepared. This is the reality of Jesus. The reality of his coming. Peter writing to, to a bunch of churches in, throughout modern day Turkey, he says, but they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. The, like Peter and Paul, are, they're saying like this thing is do not dismiss it. And let me just say, like, there's actually, Paul, or Peter uses this word judge, and like we have this as good 21st century Americans, this aversion to the word judge. Like, unless, like, it's judge not lest ye be judged. And we love pulling that verse out, and appropriately so. Um, but we have this aversion to the word judge. But here's the thing, is that there is no verdict for justice unless there is judgment. There is no vanquishing of injustice unless there is judgment. There is no dismissal and eradication of evil unless there is one who is capable and powerful to bring judgment. Judgment, if you are on the opposite side of power, is a good thing when Jesus brings it. Because judgment means things will be made right and the proud and arrogant will be knocked off their pedestals and the low and humble will be brought up. And further, judgment is actually a very good thing if the judgment is innocent and loved. Welcome into my kingdom. That's an element of judgment we don't often think of, but it is an element of judgment all the same. And here's the cool thing, is that Jesus right now has made a way so that you can lock eyes with the true king and have no shame and know that you are once in, in, a, in a way that you haven't been in any other relationship, fully known and fully loved. We have all been in relationships where we avert our eyes and we feel a measure of shame, even if we would not name it as shame. And Jesus has created a way, he has made a way so that we can look in the eyes of the creator of the universe when he comes and not be ashamed because we know that we are fully loved and fully known altogether. And it just happens that we have to say yes to what he has done on our behalf by taking the full weight of our brokenness and giving us the full measures of his grace. And all we have to do is say yes to this. And so that the judgment on us is innocent and loved, free to come in to embrace and to this new creation that I have restored and I have done away with evil and wiped away tears. The opportunity is for you if you have not said yes to that message. It's the reality of his coming and the hope of his coming and holding these two things together. But the third element is the mystery of his coming. The mystery of his coming. We don't have a lot of space for mystery in our moment because everything is so easy to get information about. You don't even have to type in google.com. Like you can just type in in your, search, in your search bar now and ask any question and you will get an answer to that question and sometimes a thousand different opinions, which is incredibly challenging when it's like a health related thing and you're like, well, what do I do now? <laughs> but we have no space for mystery because we have answers to every one of our questions and we can get to the point where we have so many answers to our questions we think that we're entitled to know everything church history throughout the history of the you know jesus followers have actually seen, seen mystery as something sacred and something to be preserved and something very important why because there is this belief that we cannot fit the immensity of god within the finitude of our brains you see, if the most, if the biggest thing in this world is, are just us, then you might not believe there is a need for mystery. But if the biggest thing in, 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 in reality is God, then there is a necessity for mystery. Because we cannot fully comprehend the nature of the one who is alpha and omega, who is one and who is three, who is beginning and end, who is creator and sustainer and redeemer and coming king. We cannot fully comprehend. And I'm not comfortable going and when I see Jesus saying, well, yeah, I had it figured out back on the other side, so you know, I'm pretty good here. You know, I'm not comfortable with that. 
So there's this element of mystery that's incredibly important. Mystery for Jesus followers is not like blind faith and it's not kind of like, well, who cares? I don't really know. I'm not, I don't want to use my brain, so I'm not going to think about it that much. That's not what mystery is. Mystery is the recognition of our limitedness as being created beings in relationship with the creator. So Paul is like, wanting the Thessalonians to understand the value of mystery. Where he says, Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Which means that like all of us right now, as Jesus followers, we live in this tension. You see, on one hand, Jesus has already come. He's come in the form of a baby and he grew up to be um, a man who would take on our sins for us so that we might live a life of freedom. And he sent his spirit into uh, the world and it's resting and inhabiting Jesus followers so that we're empowered to live on mission and love in this world and, and seek justice and care for the poor and share the gospel. And we're, that's like what we're invited to do. But Jesus has not fully, ret- he has not returned and so all things aren't restored. And so we live in, as theologians say, the already and the not yet. We live between the times, between the already, he's already come, and he's not yet returned to make all things new. Which means that we experience like glimmers of his power, but not, but not fully there in the way that it will one day be. And I had an experience of this this past Tuesday where we had this healing prayer night. And I just want to say, next time we do this, would you, it was beautiful and amazing. And healing is a confusing thing, but we believe Jesus is a healer. And we, so we came expectant for all the varieties of ways Jesus can heal. Relationships, emotions, uh, physical healing, all that kind of stuff. And it was beautiful to pray with people and see glimmers of God working, healing stuff out just in this space. It was amazing. Next time we do it, you have to come. Put it on the calendar. We don't know the date, but put it on the calendar. Um, and it was just powerful to see God work. And, and it was awesome. And then I came home and my mom gave me this call and mentioned that my aunt and my uncle are experiencing both and this kind of all of a sudden this terminal disease. And so it was like this jarring thing where like, like there was, I was face to face with the already and the not yet. Where there's this already beautiful stuff, God working powerfully to heal and to restore and to give glimpses of his kingdom that is already here, but not yet fully here. And then also, and then on the other side, there is this painful reality that hurt still exists, pain still exists, disease still exists, and both of these things work together. And I think here's the thing that we have to do as Jesus followers, in the already and in the not yet, while there is glimmers and, and, and manifestations of the kingdom, but we don't see it in its fullness, in this tension as Jesus followers. This is what we do. We go into the places that are marked by brokenness and we don't dismiss them or cynically deride them. It is very easy in a city like Tacoma to kind of like have this cynical attitude towards it. Oh yeah, this place has gone to the, but rather than that. We go into the places that, and we, we go into the places that are broken. We go into relationships that are hurting. And rather than seeking to evacuate ourselves or dismiss or go around, we go to those places and we say, God, what would this place look like if it was fully restored? If you returned and made all things new, what would this neighborhood look like? What would this family look like? What would this person look like? This person plagued by addiction or constantly kind of gossiping so that they feel better about themselves and at the expense of other people or this neighborhood that's riddled with crime or the, whatever it is, this situation, rather than dismissing it, I say, God, give me a kingdom imagination for this place. Here's what happens when you have a kingdom imagination. You start to know how to truly interact with it. When you are truly, when you're, when you're seeing what could be and what God w- will do if he restored it and when he comes and what it'll look, when you see that, then you know how to interact with it. Now you know what to pray for. 
And now you know, like, this is what I, this is what this person's experiencing, but it's not God's best. And so I'm going to start interacting with this person along in alignment with God's best, believing that God's best will show up as I continue to interact with them along the lines of God's best. And I'm not going to, I'm going to be praying for God's best for this person. I'm going to be praying for restoration for this neighborhood. I'm going to be praying for restoration for that family. I'm not going to see this as well. Yeah, that's just the way things, blah, 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 blah. I'm going to be praying for God to work and believe because I am a person that is in the already but it's not the not yet, but God's working right now and I'm gonna pray for that right now and if it doesn't happen on my timeline, I know that God will come and he will make all things new and he will wipe away the tears and death will be no more and that is a source of hope even if that's a source of mystery and it's real, it's gonna happen. Anchor, anchor, let us not, let us not move with cynicism and I, especially with, with regards to our city or regard to friends or family, let us believe and, and for restoration, even right now, even in the already not yet, even in the confusion. The band can come up right now. And I just wanna, I wanna just right now, as the, as the communion team gets ready, as the prayer team, I just wanna pray that over us, that we would be a people that are imagining restoration. So you just might take a breath, open your hands if you feel comfortable with that, and let's just be this community, that we're imagining that. We're living, we're, we're in alignment with God's best, the spirit of the living God. Would you inhabit our minds and our imaginations? Would you empower us to be people that, that, are, that are seeing things the way you will them to be and are aligning ourselves with your will and desiring and, and, and actually and asking for you to move in powerful ways so that we see more and greater evidence of your kingdom here because it, it shows up. This is not a God-forsaken place, but it is a God-loved place and help us to align with your love. Help us also to hunger for your return see it as a source of hope and to not write it off as myth but know it as reality and to appreciate with reverent awe the mystery of it. We pray in the powerful name of Jesus. Communion is available at any time during this next song. Um, you're gonna come up and there's gonna be bread that's dipped in a cup and it's gonna be given to you and it's, they're gonna say, you're gonna hear these words, Christ's body given for you, Christ's blood shed for you. We repeat those words every week because we think it's important for us to be audibly reminded of the love of God, that you are the object of God's love. For some of us, we may not know if, if we're a Jesus follower yet, and it's just very easy. Just say yes to his atoning work on the cross. Say yes to what he's done for you. And maybe taking communion is the first step as, you're Jesus, as, as a Jesus follower. There's also space for prayer, for healing, for healing or anything else, anything else in your life. We say here at Anchor, um, if there's a prayer need, there should be a prayer prayed. So don't let the timidity and nervousness keep you from the prayer uh, uh, that's available to you. And that's available on both sides. And This is a space for us to connect with God as community, as individuals. So be present. Be present to the God that is calling us to something right now in this place through communion and prayer and song.